Hi again guys and uh, guys and girls and this is uh, another video in my series Ride Days and these are basically, they're quickly put together videos just talking about each part of my trip. I had a, around 90 plus uh, ride days and these are days where I'm going from one city to another or, or staying in one city and then going on a, an adventure up to a volcano or something like that. Um, I'm going to have a whole bunch of other videos that I'm as I edit these videos, I pick out the good bits and then I'm going to put together uh, a Canova football video. I'm also going to do a, a review um, on all the products I used, good and bad, and all the things that I took with me, good and bad, and then talk about which ones are my favourites and uh, which ones you must have with you if you're going to go, go on a trip. Okay, so um, I'm also going to talk today about, um, about the bare essentials that that every, every adventure rider needs. Um, so wh where I'm going today is I'm leaving Honduras to enter Nicaragua. And um, I basically, the, the place I'm going to is called Antacrocho in, in Nicaragua. Um, it's, it's pretty much down, a fair, fair way down south in, in Nicaragua and um, it's, uh, it's, it was a really pretty place, but as I said in the previous videos, I had to get cracking um, because I was basically, um, I was basically heading, uh, get, I, I had to get by the 23rd, which means I had to get there three days earlier on the 20th, 19th, 20th. So I had like six days from here to get to Panama City to uh, get my bike ready to go on the boat. Long story short, I booked a boat earlier for, uh, for the first week of the end of the first week of December. That got cancelled on my trip only about a week before this, a week, ten days before this. Then I had to find another boat, and I, and I was so lucky because other people got stuck behind. Uh, and there's not many choices to go from Panama to um, to Colombia. You can fly, and you get you you'll fly into uh, Medellin or Bogota. You won't fly to Cartagena, so you won't start at the top. Or you can get a boat. And there's all different types of craft. You can you can do the organisation yourself, and it will still cost you quite a bit of money. Um, however, I chose. I, I ended up going on the Star Rap, which is a German German sailing ship, 100 foot long plus, 100 plus 114, 116 years old. Absolutely fantastic experience. Normally, it takes four or five days to go from um, Panama to to Cartagena, uh, we did it in three. Uh, the, the guy, the the owner, or the, the, the guy who runs the boat, it's a not-for-profit, although it's expensive, uh, 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 ship, um, it, uh, it sails, um, usually stop, stops off at the Sun Blast Islands for a night here, night there, night there, and you do all these different uh, uh, activities. We spent one night moored on the Sun Blast Islands and did some people's canoeing, paddle boarding, you know, I just jumped in the water and I was the first in, proud of that, uh, and swam to the little island where a little couple was getting married on a deserted island. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was a really cool experience. Definitely, I, I suggest you do that if you want to have it as part of your experience. It's one of the more memorable parts. Beautiful big sailing ship. We had like 16 to 18 motorbikes on the, on the ship. Uh, really good people. Everyone got along really well. Um, all different types of characters from the quiet to you know I'm in the mid middle and some some guys are a little bit crazy but it was a great experience um, yeah so I'm basically now I'm spending one day I spent one day in Honduras I'm going to spend one night I think I spent one night in uh, in Nicaragua and then I head into uh, Costa Rica and I spent a couple of nights in Costa Rica and then get across to Panama, one night in David in Panama, and then get all the way to Panama City. Panama was, I'll talk about it in a later thing, but it was just raining the whole time. And I mean pouring with rain, where you have to stop on the side of the road because you just cannot see. But anyway, so this trip was supposed to be a nice little day, like all, like, you know, I love, I've said in the previous video, these are my roads, I love them so much. It's just going through town after town, you know, it's a lot slower doing it this way, but it's a lot more fun. So yeah, here I am uh, heading towards the border. Now, I lost the footage. Unfortunately, I can't show you the footage of the, the border because I had a crash. And it, it, uh, and I would have, it doesn't worry, I'm not embarrassed to show my, uh, 
my crash, but the thing is the camera but uh, camera broke. Well, actually, did the camera didn't end up breaking it. It ended up being the memory card just broke in half inside the camera. No, no. I mean, there was. I'll tell you what happened. Okay, so about 10, 15 miles out from the border, it turns to dirt, and it's a bit wider than the road is now, um, and it's just dust and just grime everywhere, and there's trucks going past you. The problem was, is there was just potholes everywhere. It was the most ridiculous road. Um, for, for a, a border, it's just impossible. Um, and I was just like, just hanging on for dear life because you, the problem was is you were riding and you had trucks and cars coming the other way and they were swerving their potholes. So they were coming in basically in front of your face about 20 meters in front of you. And it was really disconcerting, you know, because you weren't in complete control of your bike because the, you, you had to keep your eyes directly ahead of all the potholes. It was a pothole every foot. It was just ridiculous. I've never had, and never ridden a road like it. Even some of the big off roads that I've done, nothing was like this. And it was really hard and dusty, and it was a nightmare. And what happened was, I, I went round a corner, and I was keeping my line because I had another four wheel drive on my right side trying to overtake me. And so I kept my line, and then as I got round the corner, this massive pothole and basically threw me off the bike, um, ass up in the air, just bounced up. So I didn't, I didn't come off sideways, or I didn't go over the front or anything like that, I just went straight up in the air and the bike kept going. Um, it was about eight inches, maybe even a foot deep, and it was cut out, so it was get, getting ready for someone to fix it, but it was just like a, it was like a, a, a tomb, you know, like a, a graveyard hole. It was just ridiculous. And anyway, I came off the bike, landed on my ass, and then, and landed on my ass, and then, then my backpack, so my backpack and then my helmet and the camera came out and, and went along the road and all that sort of stuff and uh, um, didn't break the camera but when I got back there was just no footage uh, on it. Uh, um, there was no footage of uh, and it cracked the memory card. Now when I got the memory card um, back the, the top of it was cracked and there was about six or seven videos from it that just, it just for some reason I've got no idea what happened but for some reason I couldn't get those files off and every time I did it it just said error error and then the, in the in the um, ghost camera it has a there's a nice beautiful view in the it has a repair thing but it just nothing would work and then I bought this software trying to repair it uh, to, so the memory card was cracked all along the top but it still worked in a way but the camera had gone off and Normally when I come to a border, I run the run the camera all the way through as long as I can. But I lost that file, I lost it the next two files afterwards as well. I don't know what happened, but I was able to get the, um, to get, once I got outside the border, I took the camera because I was trying to do it and I was getting some funny things and I took the camera off and then I took the memory card out and put a new memory card in it. Um, yeah, so unfortunately I don't have the footage. So, um, yeah, it was pretty frustrating. But anyway, so the, what happened with the accident is I came down. I wasn't hurt at all. Like uh, the backpack, I had my rain gear in and my gloves, my, my big, my heavy duty gloves and all that. So that sort of protected me there. Um, and I, when I talk about rain gear, I don't, I've got a, a jacket that I put over at the top just because if it's really pouring, it just, you know, it's better. Even though my climb never got wet underneath uh, at all, I still use that. Uh, use a little, a little light over, over jacket and then I had the big thick heavy gloves as well and then I had all my passport stuff and all that which provided me with the padding. My helmet hit my helmet hit the ground at the back but only after I, my ass had hit then my backpack and then my helmet. Didn't hit it too hard but it was enough force. It would if with, Without a helmet it would have been trouble. Uh, you don't need much blunt force to kill yourself. Um, but then when I got up I was like you know you, you, you never know what, how you're going to react with stuff like that, but I was like super hyped. You know, I was angry and all this sort of stuff, but I was like, the adrenaline was really going through me. And um, I started looking for my bike and people were stopping and all that sort of stuff, really fantastic and helping me. Look for my bike and there it was, I was in a bit of a, a ditch, but it was still upright. And I thought, oh, the bike is good, you know, and I got to the bike and that's when on the, I turned the bike off, and, like I had a quick look on the computer and there's flashing uh, uh, puncture front tyre, puncture rear tyre. Um, but what happened was there wasn't a puncture, the rim, both of the rims had been damaged. 
pretty much beyond repair. Uh, not, not So the rear end was pretty much beyond re repair, but we were able to hack it together and I ended up holding that together. The front rim, we fixed both of them. So these guys that stopped, one guy called in a guy who had a compressor and he came along and he had a hammer as well. So we started bashing the, the, um, the bashing the front of the bike. This is this is nearing where the dirt track is. That's my last uh, last photo and video. I think this one's the last photo and video before the border. And um, so we bashed the rear wheel and we got it really good. Like it, uh, we put the wheel back on, inflated, it, then tested it with air bubbles. Nothing was coming out of it. We were, I was really surprised. I thought it would. It's not going to seal. The front tire, however had a really slight bubble but we, it was really we really did a good job on the front rim getting it really smooth but we just didn't think there was anything else we could do so basically I kept, I kept going and um, yeah but uh, the guy I paid the guy like 20 US dollars to help me there was like 15 people just straight away coming to help me and stuff like that I was really really appreciative and really sweet people and all that sort of stuff I bought everyone a can of coke because uh, we were really close to the border where it happened so there was a lot of traffic uh, there, but it was it was pretty, I'm not gonna say scary because it wasn't scary because it, all these sort of things happened so quickly. Uh, but I, I, I was sort of a little bit annoyed with myself that I can't, I can't remember now how well I was concentrating or anything like that. I know that I was trying to keep the bike in, in a straight line all the time. So just trying to keep my line on the road because I was doing about 30, 40 kilometers an hour, maybe 50 kilometers an hour and other cars were doing, like big four wheel drives were doing like 80 kilometers an hour. So like, uh, I was doing like 30 miles an hour and they were doing like 50, 50 miles an hour. So they were tearing past you and then you had to deal with the cars coming the other way and the trucks. It was, honestly, they were just going sideways across the road, avoiding all the, 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 the big ditches. So I remember getting to the Honduras border and the, they, they interview you at the border, the tourist thing, and they say, oh, you know, what did you really like? Honduras and I said you've got no question about the roads like I mean it was disgusting you know and uh, I, I really if I if I did it again I would have just gone a lot slower you know because um, it did cost me you know having that front tire so when I got to cut Cartagena I got a new rim for the rear scent I sent, sent the photos through the got my guys in in Miami and they said oh, I think you only need the rear rim done replace so I got the rear rim set over and then what happened was I was I had a really slow leak on the front rim um, like it was maybe one psi every few hours but that progressively got worse and, until when I basically when I was getting the motorbike to the boat to the star rep boat I um I, I you know my psi level should be about 36 on my moto uh, on the front tire and it went from 36 all the way down to like 12 psi, and we were going down. And I don't know if you've ridden ridden bikes with uh, low psi. Um, well, well, really low psi. Like in the sand, that would be acceptable. But on a on a on a really hard road that's wet, basically the, the steering becomes heavy at the front, um, or if it's the front rim the tire that's that's low. So I had a really hard, solid rear rear tire, and a really soft front tire. So as I was coming to and breaking to corners, obviously breaking with my rear, what was happening was my front tire was was just ripping the road really heavy, and it was and it was wanting to slip all the time. So it was really hairy getting the bike. You know, I started off, you know, and that's how bad it got towards the end. Like you know, losing five psi, six psi every twenty minutes. You know, that was the worst. Then I finally got to Cartagena and got the rear, the rear rim done and then I got the front rim fixed but they never really fixed it and they screwed up another thing and you know so it'll be something I talk about uh, in one of the other videos about servicing your bike on the road and I'll have a discussion about that. It obviously depends on what type of bike you're riding and how old it is. If you've got a really old bike you're probably going to be in more luck for getting servicing because pretty much everybody can handle those bikes you know. Um, but if you've got like a newer model you're, you're, you're pretty much limited to go to the to the uh, KTM dealerships and even them, the certified KTM dealerships, out of the four or five I ended up going to, there'd only be two that I would ever go to again. Uh, some of them, one of them in Cartagena was like a, there was a little tiny shop, you know, nobody had seen a bike like mine before. So, 
again, it's a live and learn situation. And I think I've got some photos coming up of, of, uh, of the bike when we pulled it over the side of the road. It took probably about 45 minutes to an hour after I had the accident to get the to get the tires off and get them get it banged back in. And the, the guy, I mean, they they worked hard. You know, the guys who were banging the, the rim together, uh, they 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 were giving it a good whack and they kept going and going and going. Like it was pretty hard yakka for that guy. But I mean, he earned a week's or you know, maybe even more than a week's wages in in one hour. You know. So yeah, it was. Um, it's not one of those days that I want to look back again and, and think, uh, you know. Um, because every time I think about it, I always think about I wish I'd have done it differently, you know, just taken a lot, taken a lot slower. And I, I thought I was going slow enough anyway, and I was handling it. But every now and then the potholes just got so ridiculous, you know. So I started thinking, okay, look for the darker ones in the road because the darker ones were the deeper ones. But that didn't help me. Um, and you know, they should be ashamed. It, it actually, you'll find that a lot of the border roads towards the border are really screwed up on a lot of the countries. And that's because the trucks, you know, it's a hundred percent trucks. The trucks ruin the road, you know. And I was listening to the uh, to TV today, and the president uh, Donald Trump was talking that there's possibility that they might increase gas taxes because of all the trucking companies. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a sec. Most of these trucking companies are, uh, are delivering goods from massive big corporations. Yeah, the truckers deserve a break. But the thing about it is, they, they want better roads because it, you know it's obviously better for transporting goods and it's better for the economy. However, most of these massive big companies don't pay any taxes; they take all their profits offshore, and then we end up paying for the roads. You know, and that happens all over the Western world, like all the major countries: Australia, UK, Germany, all that sort of stuff. Everyone tries to avoid, which is their right, to avoid uh, paying taxes to the government. However, you know. When you ride on these roads, you'll notice that in some countries they'll have four. There's, there's a bike there. That's off the, the um, that's off the front. Uh, that's the rear, the rear tire off, and we're just checking the front tire to find out where it was actually leaking. But um, yeah, you, you'll find that you'll find that in a lot of countries they'll have four lane roads like this, and one lane's only for trucks. And so they'll have a road, and the road that the bikes and cars ride on is nice, and then, then the right lane is just completely screwed up. It's completely a complete mess. And I'll show you in some of the videos in the future, you'll see it in Argentina and Chile. It's crazy what the difference is between how much damage a truck does to a road compared to a, uh, compared to a car. I can, remember, I can remember going from this town. I'm pretty sure I stopped off at a gas station or two. Um, yeah, so I'm... Yeah, so basically, uh, after after the accident, again, like the, the last three days have been really worrying for me because I needed to get somewhere fast. And not only that, I I, I needed to be smart while I was while I was driving and not get too carried away with the amount of miles I was trying to do and stuff like that. So I still try to keep it to the same amount of distance, but the difference was I was doing those distances every other day, you know. So it be does. It, it does become pretty hard, and especially, you know, especially border crossings. If you're doing a border crossing every every other day, it can you know. I, I heard some people did two border crossings for they just skip through Honduras, and that's a tough day. That's like four or five hours at a border for the day, and then probably about seven or eight hours of riding. That's a that's a tough old day. That is. <laughs> um, so I basically I think I did three borders in three days, and and once I got to. Uh, Panama, I was like, oh, thank God, you know, because, you know, I had the big countries then, Colombia, Ecuador, all that sort of stuff after that, so I only had a few borders to go. Um, it doesn't get crazy until you get down to Patagonia where you're crossing in and out of Chile and Argentina. Well, I probably did it four, four or five times back in and out, which fills up your friggin' uh, passport, which in the end, my passport has one page left, that's it. So I have to get a new passport. I did like nine pages for this one. Some of the part, some of the passports tax are just ridiculous. They take up half a page, you know. Uh, so yeah, so um, the destination today was a place called El Tanca Rojo, which is in Nicaragua. It's like on a lake uh, near near Masaya, uh, which is it's a tourist area. But this was the off season, so it was really, really, really quiet. Um, in fact, I had I think the hotel that I stayed in 
maybe someone else was staying there, but when I got there, they were like surprised they had a guest. I'd already booked it, but they they screwed up the book. Well, they didn't have it in their system, and they had to look it all up and all that, and they finally did it. They couldn't get internet access. And, yeah, so a, a little bit of a pain. But what was great is that once I once I actually got out of um, got out of there, and now I'm in Nicaragua now. Once I got out of there, got into Nicaragua, maybe about 45 minutes down the road, I ran into three guys. They were riding bikes. They were from Nicaragua, and they were riding uh, there. One guy had a beautiful new uh, 1190 KTM, and the other the other guy, one guy had a Triumph, and the other guy had a BMW uh, GS 800, or I think it was an 800. And they uh, we I, we chatted a little bit. One of the guys could speak a bit of English. Um, I could speak very limited Spanish still. Um, and but these guys said, "Oh, they'll ride with me uh, into uh, to, uh, up to a certain distance, and then I'll be off on my way." So uh, and they were going to Managua, which I bypassed. I went around that city. But um, yeah, once you get into Nicaragua, the, the roads. Actually, this wouldn't be Nicaragua because the roads are pretty rough still. I still, I think I'm still in uh, Honduras at the moment. Uh, one, you know once you get into Nicaragua because the, the roads are really, really nice. Uh, and some beautiful, beautiful views of mountains. I could never get near them though. Like when you get to Patagonia and, and Chile, you're riding right next to maj majestic mountains, you know, and, uh, and through beautiful valleys. But Nicaragua, you seem to, all, I seem to always be a little bit of a distance away from the volcanoes, I mean, you know. But God, it was a beautiful place. Uh, all these countries are so green and lush, you know. You sort of, it's sort of like I, I imagine it anyway. But um, you know, Nicaragua is a country that I'd like to go back to again. See all the smoke coming out of it. You'll see that everywhere you go. Where trucks and buses, there's no sort of EPA laws or anything like that. I don't know whether they ever get pulled over for the crap they're spewing out, but. It gets pretty bad in some some place, some cases where there's, you're behind a truck and it's just spewing out. Uh, these are the guys that I met. So now I'm in Nicaragua. So you can see the roads now are, are really pretty. Well paved, well maintained. Again, a little bit of rubbish in the cities and stuff like that, but um, really, really pretty place in Nicaragua. I, I wish I could have spent like four or five days there like I originally planned but you know you got to roll with it and if I didn't leave if I didn't leave when I left um, I would have been stuck. Um, I, I, I don't think I would have had to get there an aeroplane with my bike and you know if, if at all you can afford it it's twelve hundred dollars to go on the Star Rap, do that because they handle all the paperwork you know I, the other people that I've met along the way that have done it differently have just been spending days just doing getting paperwork going from one place to another to get everything organized and you just don't want to be doing that when you're on a trip like this if you can afford the money pay it. plus it's it was probably one of the more memorable part, parts of my trip or one of the memorable parts of my trip you know um uh, getting on the star route and getting the sailing ship across it was a pretty awesome experience and we, we were really lucky we had beautiful weather and we had a tailwind as well which meant we we nearly we, we in 24 hours, we could have probably got to uh, Cartagena, but we, we took our time. Plus, we couldn't moor. Uh, we didn't have a didn't they, our permit wasn't for the, for the ship was for the following day anyway. So we had to just take our time. But we were rocketing the first night. Uh, a few of the guys got a bit uh, seasick. But every it's it's funny because I don't get seasick. I I'll take the tablets just in case. But I I, I haven't been seasick since I was a little kid, and. Um, I remember thinking, okay, hang on, um, you're seasick, and the number one thing you do when you're seasick is you get up on the deck and you get fresh air, you know, you don't look down, and everyone who got seasick went downstairs and just was sick for so much longer, it was crazy, there's only about two or three of them, um, but you know, if you're seasick and you, uh, if you get seasick, you get up on deck, you keep your head up to the horizon, and 15 minutes later you're feeling fine again. Um, in the most part, from what I've been told. Um, but, you know, there's people that want to lay down and go downstairs, and because all you're feeling, these are the three guys, all you're feeling is the rock, uh, the rocking of the boat, you're just feeling crappy all the time, so, yeah. 
so these guys, we, you know, there was three of them and then there was two of them and then there was just the one and then we said goodbye. And, but they were really, really cool guys. And two of the guys were pretty speedy. They, they wanted to get going and one of the guys was well, you know, lagging behind a little bit. But each to their own. You know, I think you ride it with what you feel comfortable riding at, the speed and all that sort of stuff. Um, fast motorbike riders um, usually live pretty short lives, you know. I watched a video the other day of a guy getting killed on a motorbike and he's saying goodbye to his friends and he's just, this is in a, in a, in a city somewhere, and he's just flying past car after car after car, going between cars and just accelerating and all this sort of stuff. And then somebody made a mistake, not him. Somebody made the mistake and pulled out in front of him and bang, all over. And his mum wanted to put the video out there to warn other riders, but it was all his fault. Like the person who made the mistake so, okay, it's not all his fault, that's not fair. But the thing is, he was riding like an absolute maniac. And the thing is, you, you, you've you got to always be aware of what could possibly happen on a, on a road. You see a, a, a car that's, if I looked at the distance and I saw a car coming out, I'd slow down. Even if I knew, even if I thought the car would was had seen me, I'd still slow down. I, I always work off the the theory that, they, no, you're in, I'm invisible. So I've got to, I've got to get on it, you know? Um, and so I just slow down, you know, so, you know, if I was doing 100 k's an hour, I'd slow down to about 60, 70, and then once I passed them, I'd accelerate again. It doesn't cost me any time, you know, on the, in the grand scheme of things. So it's just about being really smart with how you, how you, uh, how you behave on the road. And, and it was really sad that the kid died, but my God, I mean, what he was doing was just insanity, you know. And, it, and the thing about it is, as I, as I, I witnessed a fatality a little bit further south, and the thing about it is, is that people people make mistakes. Doesn't matter how good a rider you are, people will make mistakes, and people make mistakes every single. You go for a ride, and you ride for an hour every day. Someone's done something stupid. You know, you learn after a period of time that. Um, you learn to see all the things you need to see, like is the person on their mobile phone, which happens a lot in the Western countries. You know, in Miami here, every other person, even the police are on mobile phones. Every time I see a police car, the guy's sitting on his mobile phone while he's driving. And that's probably the most dangerous thing because they drift, people who talk on mobile phone, they're lane drifters. So they'll go from one and they'll move across. So you, you should never overtake someone unless you know that they've 100% seen you uh, you, I would not overtake someone uh, and I wouldn't uh, uh, lane split between cars if I saw someone on a mobile phone either, you know. So he's got here the GS, I think it's a GS800. They're all really pretty bikes. So the KTM doesn't, it hasn't looked like it done many miles at all. This guy wanted to go all the time though. <laughs> I'm not much of I'm not much of a fan of weaving in and out of traffic, to be honest. Um, and I don't I don't lane split that much with moving cars. I've done it before, and it, it never feels 100 percent comfortable. But uh, moving vehicles, I'm happy just to sit there. The maximum benefit I'm going to get out of it is a few minutes earlier. Who cares? Um, yeah, but I, I I remember when when that fatality happened a little bit further south. I remember thinking to myself, well, that's just a real, you know, he sort of shook me up because the kid, the kid was less than 20 years of age. He was sitting right on the ass of a, of a truck and went to pick out and took his whole bike out with him on a very slim two lane road and the bus just went bang. He was probably about 400 metres in front of me when it happened, but it was like a real shock. And then I, I mean, by the time I got there, they, I mean, the, it was just going outside of a town, and I've spoken about that before. The most time, the most dangerous places are riding through towns, um, and the start of your journey and the end of your journey. The end of the journey, you're thinking, "Oh, I've made it," you know. But usually, in a city or a town, and so you've got to be really aware because you're probably a little bit tired. So you've just got to really take your time and be aware, and not not sort of try to get anywhere quicker than. You know, all you're going to save there is seconds, you know. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to just quickly talk about some of the things that the, the tools and stuff that I, that I have that are must have um, on, on these trips. Cable tyres, number one. You, you, the cable tyres, you get, you get the long ones, the thick ones, 
and also get the really thin ones and shorter ones. You never know when you're going to need them. Half a dozen of each is going to last you the whole trip. They, they can help you with pretty much everything. Um, the other thing, um, the other tool that you definitely need is a compressor. Okay, because if you're going to go off roading, you want to be able to, you want to be able to take the tire pressure right down and, and then at the end of the off roading, put it back up. Because it's so much more fun if you can off roading if you've got a lot more grip. If you're sitting on really hard tires, like if I'm at 42 psi on the back and 36 psi on the front, you're going to dance across the dirt a fair bit, especially when you accelerate or decelerate quickly. So it's good to really get, you know, on, I'll, I'll probably take out about about 30-40% uh, off on off-roading, off the tyre pressure. And some people will say that's a little bit low, but it, that's that's my comfort level, you know, that's where I felt comfortable with. Um, in sand, you can pretty much take it down to pretty much four or five psi, you know. Um, as long as you're comfortable with the, with your uh, with your seals, if you, like I've got tubeless, um, then just, you know, you, you just got to go with it with that. That's the, And that makes it a lot easier. Even though sand is my friggin' worst enemy, I friggin' hate it. And I had one one situation where I basically spent hours trying to get one kilometre through sand. Not even one kilometre, probably. And you know, uh, once you know that when you've got a big heavy bike with all your gear on it, you basically got to, once you know you're going to get stuck, you just got to, okay, that's it. I mean, one of the times I got stuck, I basically didn't even have to put my kickstand down or anything like that. It just it was just sitting upright in the sand. Then it, you basically take all your gear off, walk it up 200 yards, walk it up another 200 yards, walk it up another 200 yards until you, as long as you're siding your bike, and then get on the bike and walk walk the bike, accelerating, you know, with the bike on it, accelerating. Um, it's a skill that, you know, I, I, got, I was really crappy at it first and was nearly dropping the bike all the time and couldn't get traction um, but after a while you sort of get to get 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 used to it a couple of times I had to jump on the bike and jump up and down on it to get some traction to get out of the out of the thing a couple of times I had to dig it a bit, bit out in front of me so it's just a you know it's a real experience but I mean if you're doing it once or twice every now and then on an adventure then it's okay you, you sort of look back on it and think oh that was cool I could, I could get through that but if it's happening all the time it's no that's a that's not a fun thing to to do. <laughs> um, I, I remember once, geez, I hope someone doesn't come past and see what I'm doing here because I look like a real amateur, you know. Um, but, you know, that's just the way it is. It's, um, yeah. So this is a little community called Messiah, which is like basically on a, on a, uh, there's a whole bunch of, um, of lakes here, some really big lakes. It's a little bit of a tourist place, but a lot of locals. This is what I love about Central and South America. You'll go through these pretty crappy towns you know, shanty towns type thing, real country villages, and then you'll you'll notice that when at school the kids are wearing beautiful uniforms, white pressed, amazing, you know, and then you see people complaining about what they have here, and you see how much pride they take in, in their education in these countries, you know, because it is a way up. For girls in these countries, it's a lot tougher because they are still considered breeding machines, but. Um, Really, really cool to see. I always love it when I see that. And that happened all through Central and South America. The kids just love their school. Really love to learn. Um, yeah, so I only spent one night here. Got here, um, you know, it took me half an hour to get checked in because they screwed me around. They didn't have a booking. Uh, it was quite a really pretty little place. The, it was pretty dated, the rooms, uh, but the beds was nice. The bed was nice, had air conditioning, even though the air conditioning system was really loud. Um, Wi-Fi was really crap, but the, when I first got there, I unpacked my gear, got everything started to charge up. Uh, the room had a, a fridge and a microwave and stuff like that. Um, had myself a shower, then walked across the road and uh, got into, uh, had some tacos and some beers and just relaxed just sort of wrote some notes about the day. Um, so normally what I do is, uh, probably, you'll probably see it as I come up to the to the end of the video now, you'll see that I, I, uh, I'll I show you the place that I stayed at. One, once I knew I was staying there, I, I'd already, I, I just stopped off and I got a drink. So I had a couple of drinks in the thing and I just didn't want to check in because the check-in is about, you know, you normally takes about 15, 20, 25 minutes and I just wanted to sit down for a second and just relax for a minute. So I just went past there and 
found a place I could uh, I could relax. But you look at this, it's a really thick jungle. Um, and quite nice, quite nice. So even though it was really hot, it was uh, when you get into this thick jungle, it's a lot cooler than out in the open road. Um, the roads are a bit iffy. I wouldn't want to ride through the, all the cobblestone roads when it gets wet. The, the bike, the tyres just don't handle that, especially when they're really hard and uh, inflated to the to the to the spec, spec you know. So. Um, yeah, so I stopped off for about 10-15 minutes and had a bit of a relax and lay down. And then I went back to the hotel, got checked in after half an hour. Unfortunately, it was a hotel that was down the, the, the bikes were right down the bottom. And even though the hotel was empty, they put me in a room right up the top. I asked them if I could have another. They said, oh, no, no, they're, they're getting ready for support. I just couldn't be bothered arguing. And uh, so I had to carry my gear up about three flights of stairs, wooden stairs on the outside to my uh, place, um, unpacked, got everything hooked up to be charged, and then uh, and then I went to, um, then I uh, had a shower and then went across the road to the restaurant, had some tacos. Unfortunately, everything was closed by about seven or eight, eight p.m. So I couldn't have anything else to eat. So I basically had an empty stomach and there was nothing there in the morning. And I left first light uh, in the morning to to get across to Costa Rica, um, where I spent a couple of nights in Costa Rica, in Jaco, which is a bit of a tourist place. Um, I'd love to ride these roads all day long like this. It's so much fun. Unfortunately, there's, car, there's other cars. <laughs> but they are, they are fun when there's no cars around. You can see the lake on the left-hand side. Lots of people walking on the streets, you know, especially around the villages. Just got to be a little bit careful of them. When we come up here to the opening where the uh, hotel is, pretty sure. That... Yeah, that's the hotel on the right hand side there where I stayed up on the hill and on the rest restaurants down on the left hand side. Just went for a bit of a scoop past there, so I found where I was staying. Push bikes and that around. Just decided to keep riding up this road. I don't know why I changed this. I think my sat nav would have shown me that it was there. Some roads washed away. And I think I'm going to get here. Good place to have a bit of a relax by the, by the lake. There's a German guy and his kid. I think this was a little private sort of like resort type thing, but I still was able to sit down. Relax, that's the water, water's edge there. Pretty cool. It's me leaving and going to the hotel. So by this stage, I already realised that my my uh, front tyre was was going down in PSI. I've got a computer system on my bike that lets me know. Um, turn left up here. So you can see on the left up the hill there, that's where the, the apartments are. Uh, well, let's me know where I've got to park. It says hello, I think it's a guy comes out at some stage here. Let's get the bike a little. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Alrighty, this guy's going to tell me what to do, and then this other guy as well. Um, so yeah, thanks guys. Again, uh, beautiful views outside the restaurant there. If you've got any, here's my beer, any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll answer them as soon as I can. Thank you.